years ago, uh, that um, uh, makes available a, a couple of um, a couple of classes uh, that that can do some things. There is also raster, as we mentioned, uh, as was mentioned yesterday, uh, that has a raster stack where the stack, the layers in the stack, can can represent uh, time slices. Um, Spacetime is a package that I will now um, discuss. Um, then there is, of course, there is other things like uh, like database backends that we discussed yesterday. If your data are really large, if you look at the Landsat archive, then it's not a good idea to try to import that in your R session in memory, so to speak. So you need database backends like PostGIS or TGRAS or CIDB or something like that. Um, the things we do in spacetime is all in memory, so it's, it's about relatively small data, right? So computers these days have large memory, so we can nevertheless work with, with moderately large data. Um, in, I, as I'm a lazy person, uh, in programming space-time, I thought about as much as possible uh, making reuse of things that we have, we can do in space, and that we can do in time, and throw them together. And it's not surprising that I chose SP to do all everything in space, but I chose XTS to do everything with my time series data. And whether that was a good decision or not, I don't know. Um, it works with POSIX-T time data, so you need to explicitly have time data, and also geologists can't work with that because it can't represent seconds at years that were 50 million years ago or something like that, right? So it, it has its limitations. Um, what, it, what it can do relatively nicely is selection, same selection on spatial on, on areas, uh, but also the same selection we, see, we saw on time, so you can select time periods, I will, I will show that. Uh, one thing you could do to look at this is to uh, go through the space-time vignette and also see, look at it if you want to know more about spatial temporal data analysis in R. You can look at the task view and see if there are things for your liking. Yes, there is things. There are packages that do geostatistical analysis of field type data sets. There are packages that do point pattern analysis in space and time on object type data sets and objects and events. Um, and there is infrastructure for uh, for panel data. Panel data is, is like you know time series of, of, of state properties or some un unemployment economical data, but time series uh, where the space-time layout is regular. Um, I will now sort of say a few words before I let you further look into this vignette. This vignette explains basically everything uh, and was... Um, here we are, SP. So from SP we can get into space-time. That depends on it, so we can look at the space-time vignette. Uh, it has been published as an as an uh, journal paper in the Journal of Statistical Software in 2012. And um, so I, of course, added these logos, and so I like logos. Um, and it, it, it has an added sentence here, it says, this vignette here, this vignette is the main reference for the R package space time. It has been published here, but it's kept up to date with the software. Yeah, so vignettes are often published somewhere. It can be, you know, papers, full papers published somewhere. But as you can't change papers when you change the software, vignettes also give you the possibility to keep updating, to keep improving, or keep the vignette at least in, in line with the software. Um, there is a bit of introductory text that, if you want to look at, you can you can read. Uh, there is an, a few notes on how a lot of uh, space-time data that we that comes at us as in the form of tables, how that comes. And I distinguish three forms: one is the time-wide table, the space-wide table, or the long table. Uh, and and you see all of them. So here is an example of the uh, SITS dataset that clearly comes as a time-wide table, time-wide in the sense that wide, the columns, represent different moments in time, where the 7-4 refers to 1974 and the 7-9 refers to 1979. <coughs> yes, You just need to know it. Yes, that's all. Um, and it even has multiple attributes. It has birth, sudden infant death, SID, and NW birth is something like, non, I think, non-white birth or something like that. So it's, it's uh, health data. A classic data set, but you see here in the in the rows are the are the counties. Yeah, so for each county we have one record, and we have multiple times. So the multiple time, the time replication is in the record. Yeah, so that is what I call time wide. 
Another uh, possibility is that, of course, happens often when we have only few time replications. We, nobody would ever, like, you know, make a table with 500 columns where 500 time steps were put in columns. That would, nobody would do that. So that is why somebody invented the space-wide format, and this is how the classic wind data set that was analyzed by John Hestlet and Adrian Raftree in 1989 uh, comes as, uh, as a space-wide data set, right? So we have here... At, as records encoded, the, the records are increasing in time. You see the year, minus 1900. Uh, you just have to know the month number, the day number. And then we get the columns. That's not, I think, that yeah, it could be all the columns. Uh, that are the wind uh, stations, so the meteorological stations where they measured wind speeds. This was a, uh, a study about spatial temporal patterns in, in wind fields. Um, is, data set is, is, is quite old and it, it's still, if you go, if you go download it, it's, I believe it still has this message, watch out before you download this data set, this is a very large file, it's almost a megabyte. Right? <laughs> uh, so they warned for that, right? know what you do. Uh, then we have the long format. Unsurprisingly, long format uh, has basically every record a space-time combination. Yeah? So all the records are under each other. So we don't have like space replications in columns or time replications in columns. We just have attributes in columns. So the whole attribute, so here is uh, uh, employment. Yes, the whole attribute is all of them are in one table. And there is a column referring to uh, location to a state and a column referring to time to a year. Yeah, so these are the three options and then from that you can go and figure out how things are organized. Um, of course the first two really work when for every location I have the same time, so for every time I have the same locations, which is essentially the same, right? Meaning that we have a space time, a st space time Layout that is regular, that is that is so-called, that is full, and that is a different, uh, an important thing in uh, in the. Can, uh, let's see if I can go down here. So, uh, well, we're used to uh, doing time on the x-axis, right? So we have different times, right? And we can also sort of enumerate our uh, locations. Whatever they are, states or, or point locations or, or polygons or grid cells or something, we can enumerate them. Uh, and a, a possibility is that for every location, we have observations at every uh, time point, and at the next observation, we have the same, right? So this is a very common case. Um, I would always, I would almost say this is uh, a common case when we have a, a field variable or an aggregation. Um, another case that happens is that we have a, a similar setup, but that it's incomplete. Yeah, so, so we have uh, many times that recur. Uh, Uh, times that recur and locations that recur, but it's it's incomplete. So somebody, something happens. You know, there was a reason. Somebody threw out some data, or there were problems in collecting it, or there were, you know, whatever that whatever was going on. It's incomplete. And the last the last possibility is that there is no structure. That is, there is just moments in time and um, and and locations in space, and and they are completely this. You know, this there is no no correspondences between the two, which would be the case, for instance, if you have a real spatial time, space time. Um, is there a way to fill these gaps? Yes, good question. Is there a way to fill these gaps? I think that is what the contest is about. Yeah. So we will we will look at that. Try to look at that later on. Yeah. Yes. Um, how would you fill the gaps? Sorry? The length of the time series? Length of the time series? Yeah, so 
Yes, there are different ways you can fill the gap. So uh, one way would be, uh, if I want to fill these gaps, uh, one way would be sort of ignoring the rest of space and look at, at this time series and try to, to fill it in, right? So it, this is a time series. So if I take this time series and I observe like this, right, how would you fill it in? Right? So you, would, you might, you know, you might do something. You might say, okay, I'm going to sort of look here and look there and, 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 and make straight line and at a number of this, you know, the, the missing sort of regular points that I would like to, to know, I, 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 I basically, on, based on this straight line, I, I find these, these, these values. That is a very naive approach. Of course, you could fit an, an elaborate time series model there. You can also try to borrow strength from neighboring points. So if there is a neighboring point that does have the full time series and is correlated, Neighboring, meaning correlated in space, you could as well use that, right? So if, if the neighboring point then tells for no, 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 I'm I'm the neighboring point, I know better, uh, and 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 I do, uh, you know, I do, I do this, you know, then it might as well tell you a very different story, right? And you might end up with very different predictions. Um, so yes, that is that is spatiotemporal interpolation. So either you do something purely in space or something purely in time, or do you do something in space and time, which I would call spatiotemporal interpolation. Um, but I didn't get there. I wasn't there yet. I was still uh, talking about sort of vague my vague talks about data structures, uh, and uh, so the next thing is thinking about space-time layout. And here is, an, here is a, a graph that basically shows the different layouts. One is the uh, where, where what I call, I have the full grid layout, where every, every combination of space and time in the space-time grid is filled. The second one is that where it's still laid out as a grid. There is a grid, but not all of the nodes are filled. And, and the third one is where I say, well, it is, I'm, and this is completely irregular. For every observation, I just have space and time, and, and whether they're duplicate or not, I just store them. Uh, and, and then there are also another sort of class of things is that of trajectories where I have objects that are, you know, that are sort of retain their identity in some, in some sense over, over time. So that's a different, different class that we will not talk about today. Uh, and then there is all kind of so you can create these different things. Another issue that uh, that you need to think of, or that I, so some things I had to think about, uh, I thought I had to think about, is that of um, time intervals uh, because the uh, um, so just like we with spatial data we have of course we have points right, but we also have grid cells and grid cells may refer to areas of a certain size. They also may refer to points. We never know, right? They don't tell us. But quite often we conceive them as areas, with grid cells with having a certain cell size. And we can also have polygons and, and areas and so on and lines. In the same time, same sense of time, uh, if you look at what time series people do, they never register the end of an observation, right? They register just a time point, right? And the time point is typically taken as uh, the start of a time interval, right? So, um, if we looked at the example of XTS, it's still here. So, the first 10 records of XTS give this date, yes, but if we look at the date, it is, it is actually, it, it turns out to be a time and it's the start of that date, right? So it's a time moment that is, indicates the start of that day. Uh, whereas the information clearly is about the whole day. Yes, and you could wonder, is this about the 24 hours or is this just about the eight hours that the market was open, right? So the open and close is the open, is the, is the moment of opening of the market and it doesn't tell so, right? It is everyone understands that from, you know, because everyone knows what open, high, low, close data is. So they don't bother. Um, if you want to, at some stage, if you want to sort of combine things and, and look at things, then uh, more, somewhat more is needed and, and you might at some stage have to define uh, time intervals and 
in the spacetime classes that I defined, there is a, an option to, uh, for every observation, not just register the time, the moment of time, but also the end time of an observation. So you can really sort of refer to the time uh, support, whether it's a moment in time or whether it's relevant for a period of time. Um, and then uh, basically the class structure here is this of the full data frame, uh, a full lattice where all points are occupied, a sparse lattice where some are not occupied, uh, and then an irregular lattice and something for trajectories. And it follows the same sort of ideas of, uh, of the SP classes that we have, basically the geometries, geometries indicating the spatial information and the time information, and then, and, and then information for the end time, so the end of the time periods, and, and these things are extended with, with data frames. So the data frame is then obviously a long table, right? Having all the, all the records, and the object should either by, you know, by being obvious, uh, being obvious as in this case, uh, this case is obvious. The uh, object should, you know, according to this scheme, one, two, three, this first record, second record, third, fourth record, fifth, sixth record, and so on. Uh, so we know how long the data frame will be. Uh, registers which space time point, which spa uh, time and space combination refers to a record in my, in my data frame, basically my attributes. And here I need to keep an index. Yes. So I, I basically have a, a second structure that keeps the index for every uh, space-time combination, which, time, which, uh, which space, which time is it. And the third one, again, is obvious, because I have as many spaces, space locations uh, as observations and the same number of time observations. So this, those are the classes in, uh, uh, that we work with in this in this package, and um, an, an interesting uh, uh, sort of thing that I figured out is that uh, it, that it is relatively uh, generic in the sense that I assume the uh, SP component of an ST of a spatial temporal object just to be spatial. Yes, that means it can be either points or lines or polygons or pixels, not grids, that is a detailed thing, but pixels represent grids, right? So, um, and um, they can also have, uh, can be spatial points data frame, meaning there is spatial information with attributes that don't change over time, right? They are stored there, so I don't have to replicate them. Uh, so, uh, so that gives a, a relatively generic framework in the sense of spatial temporal data that doesn't constrain you to work with uh, just with rasters or polygons or points, but basically does everything at once and can, for instance, work with time series of, of fields here of interpolated data. This is interpolation of the wind data set. Uh, or here points, the, oh no, these are states. So this is time series of dates, uh, of, of time series of temporal data, economical data, per state, you see here, per property attribute, uh, colored by state. So these are plotting options for, for different ways of uh, timeline plotting where I either group by state and color by attribute or group by attribute and color by state. Um, here is then this one of these Hofmuller plots where I have uh, locations and times in, in a, in a two-dimensional plot. Um, and this is a multiple time series. Uh, and then there is uh, here a plot of, of sort of a time series of, uh, of, of pixels. And these are sort of, this looks, you know, this looks a lot of work to make graphs like this, but if you have an, the mechanisms of SP where SP plot does all these kind of things, it's, it's re you know, it's relatively trivial to, I mean, it's trivial in the sense of five lines of code or something like that, not much more to, create plots that do the same thing for a time sequence when you have organized them uh, well. And then uh, here, is, uh, uh, here is an example of empirical orthogonal functions computed for, for wind, interpolated wind values, and then there is a, li a little bit on trajectories that we will not talk about today. 
so that is there, and that is that has been published, and that is also available as a vignette. So you can also, in the same way that we discussed before the break, you can also run through this vignette and try to uh, to uh, reproduce this this whole paper and look what it what it does. Yeah. So I I, uh, I uh, suggest you now continue with the uh, with the over uh, the overlay uh, vignette, and then look at this vignette. This vignette, by the way, is called JSS816. I indicated here, which is the magic code for the no, oh, it is the it is the volume number of the JSS paper. Um, as you can see, there are a couple of other vignettes: one on overlay and aggregation of uh, spatio-temporal data, one on objects that proxy a PostgreSQL database. Um, and one on subsetting of space-time objects that Ben actually wrote. But the main one is the uh, is the first, is the JSS 816. Okay, so I will now try to work on the contest and then we will talk about the contest. Has anyone of you looked at the contest data except for Barry? Barry has solved it. The question was how to cite packages. Yes, this is very important for those who write packages, and to some extent uh, for those who. Uh, uh, so yes, so there is info the, so you so you're used to citing papers, not to citing software. Uh, although people who write software like to find citations to the software they write, uh, so that they know that they didn't do it for nothing. Um, packages have package pages have citation info. So these are files that we write, right? So I suggested to use either this reference of ref or that reference. This is not automatically generated. Um, other packages will not have, uh, may have, so XTS also has, oh no, XTS does not have a paper on it. So XTS has an automatically generated citation. Yeah, so that is this. So it says the author's package title, package version, and the URL of the package. Yeah. So uh, do that, right? Use that. If there is nothing better, then you do that, and it will mostly work. Uh, as you mentioned, if you use 20 packages, should I, use, should I cite all my 20 packages? I would say that depends. Uh, definitely cite those that were critical, right? Um, what is critical? Yeah, so... I mean, for sure estimating the R square, I can write uh, one line code uh, calculating the coefficient of variation or something like that. But Everyone knows what R squared is. You don't have to refer to the package. That's true. 
So it's always, you know, uh, do refer to you that you use R, right? And, and R also has a citation. I don't think that that needs much more. So the citation for publications, for R in publication, use this R, core team, R, language, etc. cetera. Um, but you don't have to use for functions that you use from base R, this is sufficient, right? So everything from base R. So all the packages that come with base R, you don't typically cite. So if you use whatever lattice, I don't know if you would cite, you know, if you use ggplot or so. <coughs> Everyone does it. I don't think he's interested in that anymore. You might put that in as an acknowledgement, but not as a formal citation. The stuff you use to manipulate the data perhaps acknowledge that you did that. But right. Yeah, it, it is a bit of a, a, a matter of taste and a matter of finding, thinking what is trivial. I, I think that if there are uh, <coughs> decisions you made that are important, so if you use some kind of maximum likelihood method that does some kind of optimization or some kind of intricate MCMC, then it really depends on which implementation you used. So if you used your own, describe how you did it. If you used that from somebody else, cite the package. Package and package version, so everyone understands, ah, he used that. And I know much more about that, so that you know that might explain why that and that happened. Yeah, so that that helps. Whenever it's relevant, uh, do it. Yeah. What not everybody knows, by the way, is that these uh, that these packages uh, actually come up in uh, that these packages are automatically indexed by Google. Yeah. So here. Look at that. It looks as if I am RG dot bindings for the geospace. This was not this was not a uh this is not a journal paper. This is a software reference. Right? So uh so cron packages are being picked up by uh by Google as as publications. Yes, and they feed into your uh your H index. And so H indexes are the things we look at when you know when we compare applications for professor positions and so on, yeah, so uh, it's not it's not irrelevant. So there is there is sort of incentives for, for publish for writing software and publishing software on cron is is growing and people are you know there was recently somebody from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research visiting us who, his, whose single topic was how do we cite software? And then I said, well, you know, write our software and it's automatic. It comes for free. It's not ISI, of course, right? It's not Scopus, but it's Google Scholar and people tend to, to confuse that with the real thing. Uh. Yes? Uh, well, that was my intention to uh, that was my intention to let you go through this vignette, because this this vignette sort of the first half is is about you know theoretical ideas as I did the first hour. Uh, I mean, of this some slightly different kind, but but similar, but sort of more more data oriented. Uh, uh, the second half is on case studies. So I, they are not you know they are more like examples of, so they are not full-fledged case studies and descriptions of all the data because it's a single paper discussing a lot of different uh, things. Uh, there are, there is, uh, there we, we did some, Uh, ben did some actually uh, work we did for the EEA for the air quality implement air quality. Um, we did a couple of reports for the European Topic Center for Air and Climate Mitigation. That is sort of a, a group of scientists who advise the environmental European Environmental Agency uh, to. Um, 
um, how to analyze data, that we did some spatial temporal analysis of PM10 measurements in Europe for 2009. So here's the report. So you can find the report. Uh, so here's the report. Uh, so here European interpolated maps, space-time interpolated, and and a lot of analysis of these data and, and comparisons of methods and so comparisons of space-time variograms and everything, whatnot. Um, that is there. That also has a link back to this page, which contains the scripts and the data uh, with which, in principle, you could, you should be able to completely reproduce the health study if you take a few days off. You know, you give your <laughs> computer the few days the time to to sort of digest all that. Yeah. So, so there is there is a, a spatial temporal. Uh, interpolation exercise that, that we did. Um, if you're interested in spatial temporal point patterns, then a, uh, a, a package that does that uh, is called STPP, one, one package. There is another package called LGCP. Oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. Um, and cron package stpp also has used to have a vignette there is Barry Barry again where's the vignette what did she do uh, anyway there is a There's not even a citation to the JSS paper. <sighs> well, people are sort of, you know, forgetting about opportunities here. Um, okay, there, there is a paper with this, but it's just you have to find it. Uh, so it's here, j.soft, stpp. Uh, a package for plotting, simulating, analyzing spatial temporal point patterns that has the paper, uh, the package, but the, of course the more recent package is on CRAN, and and the examples. I think I know why this is, because uh, the examples were kind of all faked. But the but the paper is nice. So it has a, it is a paper on spatial temporal analysis of point patterns. Oh, wants me to. Things I didn't want to start.
Right, so for those of you interested in, uh, in spatial temporal interpolation, uh, there is tomorrow, there is Ben Grayler actually talking about spatial temporal geostatistics using and fitting models and doing interpolation. But he will, not, he will not bug you with what is a field and what is an entity and, and these kind of things, I hope. So he will assume that you understand that you're thinking fields, you have fields and you will want to interpolate. And, and so he knows much more about this than I do. Uh, so that is very good. But he's, uh, he's a PhD student in my group, um, so we work together a lot uh, on this. Um, and he might have solved the con contest as well. Bribe him. I don't know what to do.